We acknowledge the lands of the traditional custodians across Australia. We recognise Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people's continuing connection to land, water and sky country. We acknowledge the wine regions and hundreds of different nations around this continent and the ancient soils on which we stand and grow. From the Wadani salt bush peoples of Margaret River in our west to the East Coast Sunrise people of the Yuan Nation and the Southern Island and Saltbush peoples of the Nyoni peoples of Tasmania. Today and always, we pay our deep respects to the custodians, those who went before and those who will follow as the knowledge holders of tomorrow. This is Australia. Well, hello everyone, and welcome to the Adelaide Hills Chardonnay Tasting, which is entitled Elevation and Elegance. Uh, my name is Rose Murray Brown. I'm a Master of Wine based in the UK, and I'm going to be chatting with three Adelaide Hills winemakers who you can see on the screen. We have Tim Pelquist Hunt from Orlando. We have Turin White from the Lane Vineyard. And we have Liam van der Pelt from Ashton Hills. And we're going to be tasting six wines, six Chardonnays, all from different areas and different elevations. I've tasted all the wines from full bottle and uh, they're all under screw cap and they are all from the 2021 vintage. And they're priced in the UK between about 15 and 40 pounds. So I hope you enjoy the wines. Now, those of you who've got the wines, you hopefully will have this lovely brochure here. And in the brochure, you've got lots of information about the wines and about the different winemakers. Now, we obviously have three other winemakers who I'm just going to mention now who are in the brochure with their biographical details. So we've got Steve Baraglia, who's Pike and, from Pike and Joyce. We've got Daryl Catlin from Sidewood and Mark Gilbert from Karawata. They're not with us today, but they obviously are the winemakers for the other wines. Now, if you don't have this um, lovely booklet, which has got a great map in it as well, with showing where all the wineries are, then please use the file button and you can read the uh, brochure from there. And we'd really like this uh, session to be interactive. So please use the chat button for your chats and talk about the wines. And uh, if you've got any questions for the winemakers, please put them in the Q&A box. So now I'm going to ask Turin to do an acknowledgement to the custodians. Thank you. Uh, we acknowledge the Paramount and Ghana peoples as the traditional custodians of the, of the land we work and live on and recognise their ongoing connection to water, land and community. Uh, we pay respect to the elders past, present and emerging. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I'm just going to say a few words about the Adelaide Hills and then I'm going to well, start off in questions and then we'll taste the wine. So I'm just going to say quickly a little bit about Adelaide Hills in terms of in the less than 50 years, it's really shot to stardom and it's um, South Australia's sort of premier cool climate region. And geographically, it's actually one of probably one of the most diverse in um, Australia. And it's a really beautiful, lush, leafy region with dramatic hills. I have family actually who live in the hills as they call it locally. And I can see quite why they live there rather than anywhere else in Australia, a really stunning re region. Now, um, just to refresh your minds as to where it is, um, it's based about 25 minutes, it's in South Australia, based about 25 minutes drive east of Adelaide. And it's a long, skinny region which borders uh, to the north. It borders the um, Barossa and Eden. And then the, the down in the southwest, it uh, borders M McLaren Vale. And it's about 75 kilometres by 20 kilometres. And um, the we've got some maps here. Hopefully you'll be able to see these. You can see where it is in terms of where it is in South Australia. 
And uh, so, as I said, long, skinny region. It's actually really a, a, quite a large region, uh, which you'll see on a map as we're, we're, we're going through them. Very large region. And the vineyards are very spread out in comparison to its neighbours. So the vineyard area is th about 3,957. Now, in this map here, you can see on the, the green marks of where the vineyards are, you can see how spread out... And, it is in, in the Adelaide Hills in comparison to McLaren Vale or the Langhorn Creek. The highest area is Mount Lofty and uh, the highest uh, is the Piccadilly Valley and Lenswood sub-regions. So there are two sub-regions there. We're going to talk quite in detail about these two sub-regions. We've got two wines specifically from these two sub-regions. Um, so that hopefully gives you an idea of you know, where it is. So whenever you ask anybody about um, Adelaide Hills, they always mention altitude. So elevation is really key. The best grapes tend to come from the, between 300 metres and 650 metres. And with altitude, you get temperatures, moderate maritime type. It's probably similar to hot, um, and it's warmer and wetter than Tasmania, just to give you an idea. Um, and for every 100 meters you go or is it the temperature is dropping now if you were in Adelaide in the summer and it was 40 degrees then you would probably in Piccadilly Valley you'd probably be in the low 30s but the important thing is at night there's a big diurnal shift diurnal shift and the temperatures can go drop down to sort of 12 to 14 degrees which is great for retaining the acidity in the grape variety the other thing is the rainfall high rainfall here in comparison to the neighbors so Barossa 430 millimeters a year Average in the Adelaide Hills is about 750, but up in Piccadilly Valley and Lenswood, it can be up to over a thousand millimetres. But it's a really interesting region in terms of diversity of microclimates and terroir and elevations and soil and a real patchwork of just different aspects and valleys. Um, and the grape variety that grows really well across the region is Chardonnay and it's becoming their sort of flagship grape variety and I'm seeing a renewed confidence and quality in the winemaking there and they're becoming leaders in new wave Australian Chardonnay and you get an interesting mix you get affordable fruit driven styles in the sort of warmer valleys and then you get very powerful textural examples from the higher um, those two sub regions I was talking about Piccadilly Valley and Lenswood Chardonnay is not the most planted grape variety, Sauvignon Blanc is in the region. Chardonnay makes up about a quarter of the crush, but remember some of that is going to sparkling wine because they make very, very good premium sparkling wines in the region which, and, 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 a, and a category which is growing. And if you had to describe Chardonnay from the Adelaide Hills, I think you would always say it has a really good natural acidity, and, but it's got weight and it's got texture on the palate. It always has this sort of classic underripe um, nectarine flavour I quite often get. I was talking to Michael Hill Smith from Shore and Smith, and um, he was saying that, you know, you can grow Chardonnay anywhere, anywhere in the world, and you can make serviceable wines. But he said, Chardonnay only really sings on cool sites. And their motto at Shore and Smith is higher and cooler. So, Turun, I'd like to ask you the first questions. Why do you think Chardonnay grows so well in the Adelaide Hills? Yeah, I, I think, um, obviously, um, like you said, it, it's a very diverse region, um, but it's really easy to see tasting across the range of wines, um, the huge variety of styles that we've got, um, all those sort of cool, um, cool nights, um, but I think the lovely sunshine we have, um, we've got a huge diversity of sites to choose from, orientations, soils. So there's just these large number of factors that we can play within the region um, to sort of, I suppose, chase our styles or create wines of, um, I think, immense purity. Um, but we naturally get quite good fruit power um, and, and flavour intensity in the wines. And I think that's because we have very good sunlight hours in South Australia. But then with that sort of cool air temperature that we get with our elevation, um, that really locks that crispness and that drive into the wines that I think makes the wines quite special. Great. So I'm just going to pop in with a little bit of a history uh, now, because I think it's important to mention some names. 
Um, so but the first vines were planted in, in the Adelaide Hills in 1840. And between 1840 and 1900, there were about 200 grow, vine growers. But it gradually phased out due to financial pressures and lack of cool climate viticultural experience. And the modern era began in the 1970s. Um, so between 1930s, 1970s, there was there was no no vines, just apples and cherries and pears and sheep and cattle. Um, but the real visionary for uh, Chardonnay in the Adelaide Hills, as I'm sure many of you will know, is the legendary Brian Crozer. Now, Crozer went to Davis uh, in California and he was he tasted a lot of um Chardonnays in California. He was also tasting a lot of white burgundies with Len Evans. Um, and he was and he loved Chardonnay and he was convinced that you could make good quality, high quality Chardonnay in South Australia. And he realized he had to go to a cool place. So he went up into the hills. And his first plantings in 1974 at Mount Bonython sort of close to the Piccadilly Valley area. But at that time, he was also setting up a winemaking course with Dr. Tony Jordan, Wagga Wagga, in New South Wales. Uh, so he was busy. And um, in 76, after a lot of his trips, he came back. And unfortunately, he found in 76 that the sheep had got into the, the vineyard and had, had eaten his first Chardonnay vines. But he persevered, as we all know, and set up Petaluma, winery and um, the radical Tears vineyard where he still lives and still and still owns that. And it must have been an exciting place to work, Petaluma, at that time. And then he was followed by pioneers like Tim Napstein, um, the Henschkes, uh, Jeff Weaver in, in the Lenswood area, and then Stephen George of Ashton Hills, who we're going to taste the wine from. They were all early 80s and then the late 80s into the 90s, you had Shoran Smith and John Edwards of the Lane. So today we have about they have about 90 wineries in the region. And it's a really interesting because there's quite a lot of these names I've mentioned are still there. Uh, obviously, Crozer with his Tapanapa winery. Um, they're still there. And so you have a mix of these established icon names and also a new generation of experimental young winemakers who some of them moving into sort of natural winemaking and, uh, and, and alternative grape varieties. Um, and I think the way the reason it survives with these small boutique wineries is, is its proximity to Adelaide. And so there's a great energy, great collaborative atmosphere, real diversity in the region, lots of cutting edge winemaking, people pushing the boundaries. So a really exciting region. So, Liam, I'm now going to ask you a question about um, the two two sub zones, sub regions, Piccadilly Valley and Lenswood, which were the first planted. Could you tell us the difference between these two when you're tasting the wines? Yeah. Um, so the Piccadilly Valley will start there, which is based sort of just off the back of Mount Lofty. Um, it's the highest sub region of, of the Adelaide Hills. Um, we tend to experience a bit more of the direct rainfall um, that happens, so it's a little bit, um, a little bit wetter than, than say, Lenswood, which is directly next door uh, to the Piccadilly Valley, a little bit further east. It's a tiny bit lower um, and, and a tiny bit drier, but still, as you said earlier, sort of well over a thousand mils of, of rain a year. I guess the difference between the two um, sub-regions in terms of um, wine styles is, is the wines of the Piccadilly Valley tend to have a lot more um, sort of fruit purity and, and that real drive of linear acidity, um, whereas the wines of Lenswood tend to have um, or tend to, to get a lot more power in fruit weight um, and still have that, that lovely sort of natural acid as well. So um, I guess you're looking at fruit purity in the Piccadilly Valley and, and a lovely sort of um, power and weight to, to the wines of Lenswood. Yeah. Can you also uh, tell us about the the Chardonnay clones that are grown in, in the region and whether there's been a change? Yeah, so um, I guess in the early 80s and, and um, early 90s, the Adelaide Hills was really set up to drive sparkling wine production. Um, and the source material at, at that time was, was not sort of great and really the only clonal uh, material we could get was the uh, I-10 V1 clone um, or thereabouts, those, those sorts of I-clones, which were from the, the Davis University in California. Um, 
Now, for sparkling production, they crop really well. They're really good, um, vigorous growth. Um, tend to have lovely sort of fruit characteristics and, and were sort of ideal for sparkling wine. Uh, with the shift sort of now coming back to, I guess, more premium table wine production, um, the iClones are still very popular. They require a bit more work in the vineyard to manage those yields back, um, but provide the sort of sort of lovely fruit generosity um, to the wines. Um, I guess in the late 90s and early 2000s, um, some source material became available of the uh, the Dijon clothes, so Bernard 95, 96 and 76, and sort of the three, I guess, really popular uh, clones. And I guess with an increased planting of, of those, particularly in the, the Lenswood area and the Piccadilly, um, and those vines now reaching sort of 15, 20 years of age, they're becoming really popular with winemakers because they provide just extra sort of layers of texture and weight to the wine, um, a bit more diversity, and, you know, people still love the, the iClone, and it's probably the one um, thing about Chardonnay and Adelaide Hills is, is, I guess, a more broader clonal selection in your wine, you know, the better. Mm. So some people use it in single clones, but a lot of people are doing a mix. Yeah, a lot of people are doing a mix. And, and the other one I forgot to sort of mention there was, um, the the Jinjin or the Mendoza clone, there's that's not a lot of that um, around the Adelaide Hills. It's a very fickle um, variety to grow, um, quite often crops very low. Um, but in my experience, we, we tend to get a little bit of, of the Jinjin clone for our wines. And, um, yeah, winemakers really love it because it provides, you know, a lovely sort of pithy phenolic character to the wine that, that, uh, that I particularly love, but um, yeah, it'd be nice to see an increase in planting. In, in, in yeah, the Gin Gin Mendoza discussion can continue. There are lots of, um, uh, Brian Crows has written quite a bit about it, so obviously, because he was very involved with the, the initial cuttings. Do you think that Malalactic works better with Dijon clones? Um, I think, in terms of looking at the, the Probably not the clones, but where they've been planted in terms of Lenswood and Piccadilly, those two areas quite often require a high level of, of malolactic to tame the, you know, the, the very high level of natural acidity. Mm. Um, and it's quite often not perceived, you're not getting those sort of yogurty, um, you know, ice cream characters that, that you tend to get if you take a warmer site and, and put it through an aloe. So it's, it's probably a tool that we're using in the cooler sites to just tame that natural acidity and just provide a bit more weight and texture to the wine. Yeah, cool. So, Tim, um, do you think that the Adelaide Hill Chardonnay styles have changed over the years? Yeah, definitely. And I think when you talk about c kind of touching a little bit on the history of, you know, the Adelaide Hills is not um, by any means a new region. There's a lot of history and I think um, kind of touching on a little bit of what Liam was talking about, the introduction of clones as well, that's been a real game changer and that's really changed changed the style, particularly with the introduction of some of those Dijon clones in the late um, 90s as well. And I guess thinking about the Australian um, Chardonnay style as in, in general, as the 80s and 90s, everything was big, um, you know, wine, wines were big and shoulder pads were big and everything, everything was big in terms of, um, you know, the bombacity, I guess. And, and with the introduction of some of these clones, which are more suited to the, uh, to the climate and also understanding cool climate viticulture as well, um, you know, touching on what happened between the 1870s and the 1930s is viticulturally there probably wasn't enough understanding of how to actually farm the land and, and treat it. And so in the last, um, you know, really 40 years, the Adelaide Hills has really cut its teeth in terms of defining itself as a, uh, a standalone cool climate region which has the clones, which has the climate, which has the rainfall and which has the, the winemakers. So I think with that, there's been a real evolution of style. And the thing that I love most about Adelaide Hills Chardonnay is it's just in this really good spot where malolactic fermentation has been tamed, natural acidity is just on point. Um, you know, oak is being used really judiciously to create these wines that are really not one-trick ponies. I think the thing that really defines Adelaide Hills as a Chardonnay region is the wine is really three-dimensional because when you start talking about an Adelaide Hills Chardonnay, you, 
you often talk, you start going to this dichotomy of thought where you're talking about things that stand in contrast, and I think that really makes these wines really interesting because you start talking about breadth of palate, but then tightness, but then length, but then it's got this lovely uh, peach fruit, but underpinning it is all of this lovely citrus, and then there's a little bit of butter, but it's got this crunchy acidity. And you just start going on and on and on and talking about contrary things, and you just kind of need to put the put the pen down and go, man, this is really, really exciting wine. So I think the Adelaide Hills has changed in so many regions uh, for all of those regions in terms of climate selection, uh, viticultural inputs and what the winemakers are doing. And we've got wines that both have that real scintillating purity and, and acidity, but there's also so much meat on the bone as well that's giving you Chardonnays that are just so sumptuous that you really want to sink your teeth into. I yeah, think, I think, yeah, I think we're in a really, really good spot. And I think this flight of wines is really going to excite excite you and excite everyone because it's, yeah. it's you're in a good place. Yeah, a great diversity. Yeah, and there seems to be earlier picking, um, and probably less batonnage and larger oak being used. Yeah, definitely. And I think those things play to. We always want fruit to be the hero. Oak should never be the first thing you, you smell, nor the last thing you, that you taste. Oak, oak plays a very important second violin, but fruit needs to come first. Um, the dirt always wins, so it comes from that, and you just you, you just play to those strengths. Probably looking back, you know, 10, 15 years ago, the pendulum swung a little bit to, I guess, making wines that were just a little bit more closed and almost a little bit more anemic, whereas now it's just swung back to creating those wines that are just really sumptuous. That you, you, yeah, you so we're going to gonna start um, tasting the wines. So uh, just to, to, to lead us in, Tim, because you're going to talk about the first two wines, could you just talk about the, the 2021 vintage? Because I've heard all yeah. sorts of superlatives about it. Yeah, so the 2021 vintage is one of the best, I think. And I know a, a lot of people say this is the best, best vintage ever. Um, this is one of the one of the best vintages. What led into it was really good winter rainfall. So subsoil moisture going into uh, bud burst was at um, basically saturation, which is really a good a good thing because you want your wine you want your vines coming out of dormancy in a really good spot and not being not being too thirsty. So uh, there was ample subsoil moisture uh, coming into September. Uh, the there was enough subsoil moisture to, um, to to still set the vines up really, really well. Going into November, we got nice uh, warmer conditions as well. Sometimes one of, one of the challenges can be um, rain, frost, wind. Uh, we didn't really have much of that November, which gave us two things. It gave us really even fruit set around flowering. It also gave us yield as well, which was awesome um, for so many um for so many reasons and it's great to be able to make when you know that you can make wines of real integrity and you know that you can make a bit more of it then that's mutually beneficial i think one of the things that we kind of felt coming out of the bushfires from 2020 was that by no means affected the whole region but it did um, affect a significant portion and 2019 as well was slightly lower yielding as well so I think for the region and for the wineries and for the growers, 2021 was the vintage we really needed and it's the vintage we got. Coming into January, the long-term average temperatures were pretty cool. Um, there was a, a, a couple of rainfall events in late January going into early February, which was quite a good thing because, it, again, it topped, topped the vines up. And then going into February and March, it was just so cool. Um, I mean, both figuratively and literally, um, it was it was awesome below the long-term average, warm days, cold nights. We didn't really have too many days above 35 degrees. Everything just sat there really nicely. Flavours developed beautifully. Natural acidity was retained. Night times were cold. Picking temperatures, you could, you could pretty much pick any night of the week and you would be picking when it was really cold and you'd just be bringing this you know, this pristine fruit into the into the winery. I, I think all of these wines, um, from a Chardonnay perspective, really make themselves because in terms of the custodianship of fruit that Adelaide Hills winemakers were, were presented, it was just 
absolute perfection. And if you could if you could carry that along the whole way, then you were rewarded with some pretty good wines at the bottle. So let's talk about the first wine, which is the Pike and Joyce Scirocco um, Chardonnay, 2021. Uh, Pike and Joyce established in 1998, just in case you're wondering. And obviously they have association with, um, it's made in Clare Valley, isn't it? The fruit's grown um, in Lenswood. So do you want to talk about the wine and uh, about Pike and Joyce? Yeah, so I'm speaking on behalf of Pike and Joyce and Steve Bragley, who I caught up with just to have a bit of a chat uh, about this. So it's a collaboration between the two families in um, Pike and Joyce. The Pikes have obviously um, a well-established uh, vineyards and the Joyce uh, family were um, apple growers and they've kind of combined that, that love of uh, viticulture and horticulture. Uh, this is a, a single, um, this is from their Lenswood vineyard as well, sits at about uh, uh, I think it's 520 to 590 um, metres above sea level as well. Um, the wine itself uh, is uh, picked, um, I guess, early, although I kind of disagree with the, the theory of picking early. You just pick when it's right. So I'm just going to say it's, it, it was picked when it was picked when it was right. Um, and it's uh, uh, lightly cold settled, uh, Racks taking um, taking solids, taking green um, green solids as well, uh, barrel fermented as well. Um, only gets about 20-25% new oak as well. Um, most of which is uh, French barriques in uh, a mix of mix of coopers as well. Um, yeah, the wine about, itself. The wine what about itself. The taste of the wine. Are you just going to talk about the taste of the wine? What do you think? Yeah. Um, I think this this wine's really in that melon melony spectrum. It's it's showing that nice um, honeydew character. There's also some nice white flowers underneath there as well. Mm. It's got quite a bit of strut match sort of reduction. Um, that sort of slightly funky kind of curry leaf nose. Um, yeah, that's it. I, I like the flintiness on that, and there's quite there's quite tight drive on it as well, and uh, quite a pristine acidity. And, the finish shows this nice um, kind of hazelnut, like almost praline, crunchy, uh, crunchy element on the finish. So I think it's it's judici judiciously made and quite closed. Um, it's quite a mm -hmm. quite a delicate and refined style, but I think it's I think it's really balanced. Yeah, really precise fruit. It's but it's got yeah. a zestiness and a juiciness, but 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 really quite complex. Uh, it's restrained, but it's quite complex. And, and there's lovely kind of natural searing acidity that you got lovely with something like crispy, crispy skin pork belly, something like that to kind of cut, cut, uh, could cut through it. Um, so and if I, I know that if anybody's visiting the Adelaide Hills, it's sometimes it's quite difficult to get a good vantage point um, to see the whole hills, you know, because there's lots of lanes and towering gum trees and things. But if you go up to Pike and Joyce, you get the most amazing view, don't you? It's sort of 180 degree view. So it's a good place to go, if you, well, for a cellar door, but also to a review. So should we talk about your wine um, now? And uh, I think is really different to the Pike and Joyce. Yeah. Um, so this is uh, our 2021 Orlando Lindale. Chardonnay, this one hails from Woodside, so it's a single vineyard. Um, we don't necessarily always call that out, although it is typically uh, typically from the same grower. Um, stylistically, this is quite different. Mm. I think with this wine, you see it, it sits more in the lime zest spectrum. And it's got this lovely, uh, lovely matchstick character, which has been driven from some of those, some of those ferment characters, also from uh, uh, time on time on leaves as well, and also some of that from oak as well. The difference in this wine, I see a lot more breadth on on the palate. It's 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 a bigger style and probably not quite as closed um, as the Pike and Joyce is and I, I like them both for, for different reasons. I, I love the the complexity in this wine. I love the, the cashew butter and the flint and all of the complexities that are so associated with that. 
Mm, lovely voluptuous wine, um, mm. lovely creaminess to it, as you're saying, sort of cashew nuts. Yeah. And it, yeah, seems to real... carry, it seems to carry the new oak really well. Yeah, so it's about 80% new oak, which I realise in the grand scheme of things sounds pretty big, but it really sucks that fruit up well because it's, again, coming back to that point, oak is neither the first thing that you see or the last thing that you taste. And the finish is all of those secondary characters that make Chardonnay so exciting because you get all of that lovely gum flint and you get all of that kind of burnt butter. and But you also get this almost um, pavlova freshness as well and that kind of works really, really well with peachy goodness as well that, that comes from that. So there's, there's creaminess that comes through from that. There's only about 20% malolactic fermentation in that wine as well, so it's not huge. So we, we taste that pretty regularly in barrel and then kill malo at the exact right point. And for us to make a Lindale out of 2021 was a real joy because it was so obvious from the get-go which parcels were going to make this and and how it was how it was going to ferment. It, again, it was barrel fermented as well, hand-picked, um, gently pressed on a champagne press cycle and taking full solids as well. So all of those solids uh, drive all of that complexity as well and leave you with, again, I think those those characters where you just you start talking about all of these contradictory things which make Chardonnays that are really exciting and ones that I really like to drink. Mm. And interesting, in this vintage, it comes from 100% Woodside, doesn't it? Whereas... Mm -hmm. In other vintages, previous vintages, you've added in some Piccadilly Valley fruit. Yeah, we have, we have. Um, it, it just so happens that this year the Woodside, uh, the Woodside fruit that we brought in was the one that we felt would make um, make the best wine, and and it did in that year. Um, in 2019, we did have uh, we brought in a bit of Piccadilly, so that was from two blocks as well, and that was just kind of to to sharpen it back up. I think in 2021, just the natural acidity and um, all of those factors just worked so well in that Woodside block. Uh, it, was the, it was the natural choice to make, to make that wine, which is our flagship Chardonnay. Yeah, well, thank you very much indeed. Now let's move on now to Turin. So just before we uh, talk about the wines, Turin, can you just talk about yeah. sustainability in the region and also how many produce, how many growers are organic and biodynamic? Um, yeah, so I think sustainability is a really important thing in the Adelaide Hills. Um, we're a big watershed region, so we're the, basically the water catchment for the city of Adelaide. So... Um, Soil health, water health, all those things are really vital and really um, quite protected from the government as well as from the producers obviously we want to make sure we're looking after just the sort of natural gem that we've got in the hills here. Um, there's um, quite a number of organic biodynamic producers. I won't go through them all by name. I don't have an exact number on those. I did try to find, but there's a couple of different organic certifiers and all their lists are very confusing. But there's also a new movement that's very exciting, which is certified sustainable, um, which I, I suppose biodynamic organic have their, their practices and they're looking at no synthetics um, and, and really so soil health. And the sustainable aspect is looking at the whole business. So it's from um, trying to, I suppose, do as much of a, a closed loop in terms of bringing as much from yourself um, you know, looking at your packaging, looking at how you're managing your vineyard, how you're managing your winery and making sure really holistically um, that you're being as sustainable for the long term uh, as possible and you're reviewed yearly and, and you know, I've been through the audits and they're, they're actually slightly more rigorous than the organic audits. Um, There's a lot of paperwork involved, but it's a really good program. It's had a massive take up in the first year with over 70 people joining that one. So um, at the lane, we're doing a number of things. Um, whilst we're not certified organic, we do use um, a lot of those principles in the vineyard. Um, we've got a recirculating spray unit. So, um, you know, if you're doing your sort of, you know, copper, sulfur sprays that, that 
all organic producers do. Um, it's actually sucking up any excess spray, so you're not overusing things, you're not over applying anything um, and recycling that back through. Um, we've got a herd of sheep uh, that we use to basically through the, the winter months, early spring, um, autumn graze through the vineyards, which means we're burning less diesel, there's less passes with the tractor cutting grass and all of those things. And then of course you get free sort of um, fertilizer along with that as well. Um, and yeah, we've, we've got um, yeah, a number of things like solar and all those sorts of things that we, we use to make sure that we're sort of closing that loop as much as possible. And um, of course, you know, glass and things have to come from off site, but as much we can do in house we are and making sure we're, you know, really sustainable for the long term. Cool. Thank you. So should we start talking about the Sidewood Estate Chardonnay? Absolutely. I know they're, sort of, they're, they're quite close to you in terms of um, the lane and, and Sidewood. So you obviously know them very well and the owner, yeah. uh, Owen Inglis. Um, yes. So. Uh, yeah, so side, Sidewood's one of the, um, I suppose, newer um, wineries in the Adelaide Hills. Um, but they've absolutely just sort of exploded um, in terms of what they're doing there. They're focused to quality viticulture. They've got a number of number of vineyards across the region. Um, beautiful winery, beautiful cellar door and restaurant. Um, and I know Owen um, has his flagship Chardonnay, the Owen, which is made from Mendoza clone. Um, and uh, but this one is predominantly high tech B1, um, which is that classic Adelaide Hill Ch um, Chardonnay clone um, that you'll see in quite a lot of vineyards across the hills. Uh, the winemakers, uh, Daryl Catlin and Henry Borchardt, very, very skilled winemakers. Uh, and yeah, they've been very, very successful and produced some really beautiful wines. Uh, this is their estate Chardonnay. So predominantly um, off their, um, off, off one vineyard, but a little bit from another one. Um, but I guess you'd call that the sort of in the, the central hills, so in the heart of the hills where um, as you get away from Mount Lofty, it does get drier and sunnier, so you tend to see slightly richer expressions. But I think they've got tremendous um, sort of austerity and poise in this wine, along with those um, really beautiful sort of, um, I suppose, the white peach um, sort of richer sort of characters coming through. But I think perfume uh, is really important. Um, they've got jasmine, but I mean, any sort of white flower, I think is something you see in the classic Adelaide with Chardonnay. And this is, uh, had about, uh, I think it was, sorry, 20%, 30% new oak in it, but it really, I think, just sits in the wine beautifully. It's very mm -hmm. integrated, very elegant, um, has beautiful, you know, fruit intensity with it. Yeah, it's very, very lychee'd, isn't it? Lots of yeah. lychee and, and that sort of nashy pears and, um, it's like a kind of like a really ripe Chablis in a way. Uh, and, mm. and price wise, uh, it's really on the money, I think. Um, I think they've done a very, yeah. I think that, that he's a really good winemaker. He's done a very good job of making a very soft, approachable, quite commercial style. And you can yeah. see it working really well in restaurants. Absolutely. Yeah, I think that that is just a really terrific um, example of a classic Adelaide Hills Chardonnay. And I think, yeah, that value for money price point on this is, mm. um, very poised, beautiful wine. So they say they're the biggest, the, the largest growers in the region with 120 hectares. And then after them, I suppose it would be probably you know, Penthe and then Shaw and Smith. But a lot of people have got sort of 20 hectares, haven't they? But this is, they're obviously yeah. focusing on viticulture, as you were saying. Yeah. So should we now talk about your wine and compare Absolutely. that with the Sidewood, which is a really different yes. wine? So th this is our flagship Chardonnay. Um, and uh, at the lane, we're in Harndorf. Um, so we're sort of, again, in the, the centre of the Adelaide Hills. Um, so going away from Piccadilly um, and up the other side of the valley. And it does get a little bit sunnier and a little bit drier out there. Um, so I've sort of had the pleasure of working with this winery for 10 years now and really understanding the blocks. So this is a south facing block. So it's one of the coolest aspects. It's perfectly even right across the vineyard which I think is really, really important in that site selection. Um, uh, Bernard 95 clone, uh, which is a, a tremendous, you know, um, sort of table Chardonnay clone. With this wine, um, definitely looking for tension. Like this is a wine that we, we build to sell it. So I really, I, that picking decision, I think Tim talked about earlier, 
is the most important decision I make all year. I spend a lot of time in the vineyard just making sure we get that snapshot just right where you've got that tension and that power and that drive. And I want it to be a very tightly coiled spring. Um, hand picks literally 50 meters away into the winery, a uh, whole bunch pressed down to barrel, take a reasonable amount of solids. Um, and, and this has had 86% new oak and 100% mail oak. But I think when you have that tension and drive in, in the acidity and the fruit and the minerality, it just eats it up and um, you get, it sort of looks more like 30% new oak. So that's, um, this, this is a wine I love. Um, I, I love the, the reduction of flint and the, those little sort of barrel firm and nuanced characters. Um, so yeah, pretty special wine I'm quite proud of. Lots of texture um, yeah. and sort of uh, that sort of lemon curd and a little bit of butterscotch and um, real weight and power and texture there. But I feel that it maybe needs a little bit of time to unfurl. I feel that it, mm. it could be maybe better in the future. And I think that it would be an infanticide to, to, to drink it now, personally. I think it needs to be kept. To, that's one of the yeah. problems, isn't it, with um, something like the 2021 vintage. It's such a good vintage that um, everyone would be wanting to drink them now. But, you know, yes. some of them, I don't know, how, how long do you think this one would last in terms of, you know? Like, like, honestly, 10 to 15 years, I think you could comfortably mm. sit on. And, you know, I, I really, when, when we're selecting this, because this is our, our sort of premier, our top tier Chardonnay. So I really want, like I said, I want it to be that tightly coiled spring and... That obviously takes time to unwind. Um, giving it to Kent does help, but um, yeah, this this is really designed for the long haul. Yeah, but great density and depth and sort of muscle to the wine. It's a lovely wine. Now we've got a question here from Hannah Allgate. who says, "How feasible is it to be biodynamic in the Adelaide Hills?" So Turin. Yeah. Uh, so I actually worked at a biodynamic vineyard while I was studying for a year and a half up in the hills at Naringa, which are yeah beautiful people, very passionate. Um, and, and they do it quite successfully up in Mount Barker. Um, I, I think, I, like, I, I really like a lot of aspects of biodynamics and there's plenty of people who do it. Obviously, the high rainfall in certain years can, can pose a challenge, um, which is where a lot of people have gone more towards a sustainable option, which sort of, you know, you, I guess you can take 80% of, of those things from the biodynamics, but um, it still gives you the ability to, um, you know, in, in a way you, you can use, you know, um, sort of applications that sort of um, biodynamics won't let you use, but it's, um, it, it, it is entirely possible. And there's there's quite a few, or a handful of people who are doing it very successfully. Hmm, great. Uh, well, but it's definitely, you know, it's it's definitely something that requires a lot of input. And yeah, I definitely had the blisters back in the day to prove it. Yeah. Well, so should we move on to you, Liam, now? Uh, and if you want to say anything about being biodynamic in the Adelaide Hills, please do. Uh, I don't know whether you've got any feelings about... Um... I, would, I would say that um, when you choose to be sort of biodynamic, organic, um, it's it's really a dedication to the cause that really comes out on top. Um, Attention to detail. Doing those sorts of things in, in any region is, is going to be difficult, whether you don't have the rainfall or you know the climatic conditions that we have up here we, you know it's particularly difficult because of the rainfall that can pose you know significant disease pressure in some years but um if you're 100 percent dedicated to the cause then you can absolutely absolutely do it cool so should we talk about the Karawata ants garden chardonnay which was made by mark gilbert yeah so um the, the Karawata story, they were really um, sort of big cultural, um, I guess, consultants and workers um, throughout the, the Adelaide Hills. Um, and uh, with a bit of their own vineyard um, and a bit of purchased fruit, um, they've started their, their little wine label. So this comes from down further south in the Adelaide Hills, so down in uh, Meadows. Um, altitude down there is somewhere around the to 450 metres above sea level. Um, it's a little bit more inland, a little bit warmer. So this is probably one of the wines out of the bracket that I guess shows the, the sort of generosity of, of what um, Adelaide Hills Chardonnay can be. Um, it's made probably very similar to the, the rest of this bracket. It's hand-picked, it's whole bunch press. Um, it, it looks like they take quite a 
a bit of the lease to provide a bit of texture and stuff. I guess the only thing that might set this apart from the last couple of wines is there's only partial Merlot in this wine. So I think if they had have gone full malolactic on this wine, it would have um, rendered you know the wine very sort of round and broad and um, they've kept some of that lovely sort of natural acidity in there but provide a little bit of that, um, I guess, texture and, and interest from that malo by just, just going through partial malolactic. So I guess, yeah, this just shows that sort of a, a bit warmer sort of... Um, uh, a bit warmer climate um, that, that sort of meadows experiences, um, but still has a, a lovely sort of, you know, nice linear acidity and, and, and good drive to the wine. Yeah, he was saying, um, Mark was saying that um, he likes to release the wines later. So he said that he won't be actually releasing this for another couple of years. Um, I mean, his his take on it was that he said it's very delicate and it's quite sort of tight, chubbly like I thought it was had quite soft acidity, actually. But he said yeah. that, you know, he's making wines to age. And I think he's been doing this sort of single vineyard, small batch wine project since um, 2012 or something um, and wanting to sort of um, but, but very small. I mean, he's only making 2700 bottles or something. But um, a, a, an interesting wine. And I think, um, you know, it could develop. Um, certainly. Uh, he was saying that he prefers punctions. Um, is that something that you agree with? Do you think that more people now are using punctions rather than, you know, smaller breaks? Yeah, I was, I was just about to raise this, this point. Um, I personally like punctions for the, the sort of lower impact um, on the wine. And I think it's probably not so much Debating the, you know, is punching better than Barrique or, or anything like that. But I think we've seen with that stylistic move to, um, I guess, wines that have a bit more texture and, uh, and power, um, but still retain that acidity compared to the 80s and 90s Chardonnay that, that Tim was talking about earlier. The, the time in oak has come right back from sort of 12 to 16 to 18 months to, you know, these are probably only in oak for sort of seven, eight, nine months before they're they're pulled out and maybe put into stainless for a bit of time before bottling. So, um, you know, each producer will have their their own preference of using punching and barrique. We use a mix, but it's mostly punching. Um, you know, people like Penfolds, it's it's one hundred percent barrique, and uh, the the maturation time is very similar. So it's sort of that seven to nine months, so really short time in oak, um, where you can. You know, do that nut and build your texture, and then it's out of oak and into stainless and into bottles. So, mm. so Ashton Hills, Piccadilly Valley. So, um, you've been there how long? Have you been working there? Uh, I started at Ashton Hills in two thousand and nineteen. Right. Um, having moved up from um, Farnborough, um, but yeah, the, the Piccadilly Valley, is, as we sort of spoke about before being the sort of higher, cooler, wetter part of the hills. Um, I guess all that means is that in the difficult years, it's really challenging um, in terms of, um, you know, viticulture and, and management of, of the vineyards. Um, just having that sort of lovely daytime sunshine, um, especially in the morning and early afternoon, but by the late afternoon when it's starting to get real hot, the sun sort of set behind Mount Lofty and we're back in the shade again. So that really helps helps retain that, that sort of natural acidity. And I guess what I think great Piccadilly Chardonnay should have in, in the best years, and I would say, you know, great team, the 21's probably one of the better ones we've seen in, in quite some time, is it should have a lovely power and drive and fruit weight to the wine, but it, it should really be you know, held together with that lovely, you know, really almost scintillating drive of, of natural acidity. So the, the cooling down of the night time and helping to retain that, that natural acid in the, in the grapes is, you know, really why we only mess around with, with fruit from, from the Piccadilly Valley. So um, I guess I'm looking for this wine, a bit of that sort of struck match complexity, if we can get it in the right years. You know, some years you manage to get lots of it and other years, you know, it's um, it goes and miss. But... Uh, I'm, I'm looking to build layers and textures into the wine, have a lot of interest, um, have that sort of lovely fruit purity um, and, and that, that drive of acid and have that oak sort of um, sitting in the background. Like sort of Tim said earlier, we don't want it to be up front. We don't want it to be the last thing you taste. It should, should play a support role to, um, to the fruit that you get. So. Mm. So you're south facing, is that right? On a sort of ring? Uh, that's that's the Ashton Hills site, south facing. So the, the two vineyards that we we get for this um, 
this wine uh, um, right tucked behind Mount Lofty, that would be uh, west facing, no, east facing. Uh, and the other one is, is sort of, you know, gently sort of southwest facing. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah, in those in those cooler pockets pockets of the of the pickle. I thought it had a lovely lime, limey sort of grapefruit, um, quite a, a powerful wine actually, quite a sort of taut and yeah. that lovely linear style and really, really focused and with a great acid line, but it had a lovely sort of savoury sophistication to it. Um, and, and really, um, it, it's so different, I think, than some of the yeah. other wines we've been tasting. Yeah, that sort of savoury, textural or element to the wine i think that's probably attributed to that mendoza pine that we mentioned earlier and that provides a bit of that sort of pithy phenolic interest to, to the wine that you know perhaps some other clients um don't you know manage to get so we've got a question here from sarah armoured do you find fewer producers making south australian chardonnays in classic warmer regions and is this playing well for adelaide hills and perceptions of South Australian Chardonnay. Yeah. Who would like to answer that? Me, you, Tim. <laughs> oh, I, think, <laughs> I think all of us can can have a go at the have a go at the question. It's it's an interesting one. Um, Chardonnay is still still king. It's still uh, the most planted um, white grape variety, I think, in the world, if I'm not mistaken. Don't fact check me on that, but I'm pretty sure. So I think the important thing to remember is there's a huge density of um, this variety of style and it's more about cutting your teeth in the style that works for you. And I'll go back to the original point I made about Adelaide Hills Chardonnays. Adelaide Hills has cut its teeth in making a modern Australian Chardonnay style that suits well to the dirt. And that's something that we know that we can do well and will continue to grow up to do. And we're continuing to evolve on that journey because there's no point on hanging on your laurels because we need to keep evolving with that style. So there are other uh, regions in uh, South Australia that make some excellent Chardonnay. It's not Adelaide Hill Chardonnay, it's Eden Valley Chardonnay or it's um, you know McLaren Vale Chardonnay or maybe it's more voluptuous and it's from the Barossa, but it's more about how do you how do you cut your teeth as a region and how do you make something that's going to be scintillating that's going to talk to the dirt that it's grown on and how are you going to excite people so mm -hmm. taking south australia completely out of the um, out of the equation you look at somewhere like the hunter which is subtropical more in your um, uh, is a warmer climate they've adjusted the techniques that they use to make chardonnay by not using as much malo in a region um, like the Adelaide Hills, we know that that acidity at zero malo in cool years like 2021 can be a little bit abrasive. So we're we're able to adjust it. So you're presented with so many options, whether it be your house style, whether it's be whether it's the dirt, that, um, whether it's the dirt that it's grown on. Um, all of these all of these things kind of help to define that style. So I don't think um, any. Uh, warmer regions or any colder regions or whatever um, are necessarily competition for the Adelaide Hills as a region because we make Adelaide Hills Chardonnay, we do it bloody well and that can't be taken away. <laughs> yeah, so um, Toron actually, why don't you tell us um, if you, because the thing is in the UK I think probably places like Yarra Valley are better known for the Chardonnay but um, mm. we want more people to know about Adelaide Hills. So could you could you tell us how it fits in with um, other Chardonnays from Australia that people might be looking at, for example, Margaret River, places yeah. like Tasmania? So I, I think sort of probably leading in from the last question, what happened in Australia when I suppose Chardonnay fell out of fashion from the 90s, is it retracted back to the sites that did a very good job of it and the people who were passionate about it. So Chardonnay never went away in the Adelaide Hills. Um, and then I suppose what's been happening, especially in the last 10 years, is this refinement of style and development and people, uh, I mean, there's obviously some classic producers who you know, they know their style and they know what works for their site and they've kept doing that. But there's been 
um, this huge, I think, evolution in style and and um, just fine tuning that's gone on from the Yarra Valley to Adelaide Hills to Margaret River. And I think Margaret River have their style and um, slightly warmer, and they have that really incredible generosity mixed in with the gin gin, which um, has incredible acidity. So they, they're able to make these wines with that tension and that power. Um, I think the, I mean, the Yarra Valley, I suppose, is, is probably, I don't actually know if it's bigger in terms of producers, but, you know, it, it's obviously, um, uh, I, I think, um, got a very good heritage of cool climate winemaking. And the Adelaide Hills, there's been a couple of leaders, but really there's this wave of cool climate winemakers coming to the hills looking to make cool climate wines. Um, and that's just accelerated the flight. And I mean, you can see how well the grape does here. Um, it's a really good location for it. And yeah. um, we're probably maybe not as opulent as Marks and we're not as fine boned as Tassie. Um, and, and I think the diversity of the region gives us the ability to make those, you know, uh, the sort of average growing season temperature in sort of Piccadilly and Lenswood was basically like Northern Tasmania. This year, it, it was very cold and there's very austere wines and powerful wines in that respect. Um, but yeah, I think the Hills just has the ability to do an immense variety of styles. We're not just boxed into this one little window of this is our house style. Um, and I think, you know, that versatility is our versatility. Yeah. So I have no way to answer the question, but that's, <laughs> yeah. So I've just one quickly, because so we've got just a few more minutes. Um, Liam, if you want to answer this um, about climate change, have you found that you you you're you know you've been affected by climate warming? Yeah, um, I mean it's undeniable to say that that things have changed um, up here. Um, I, I talked to Stephen, who started Ashton Hills back in um, 1982, um, planted the vineyard, and um, he, you know he talks about you know the harvesting. Pinot back in the day on, on sort of the 1st of April was, was the, the general rule. Um, now we're sort of harvesting on the 1st of March uh, and that's only over a period of 38, 40 years. It's, it's, and it's a regular thing. So it's, it's, it's undeniable that things are warming up up here. Um, that is why we are sort of sticking to the, the cooler sites. Um, you know, the big billy, you know, being that, that sort of cooler end, then to you know, um, another extent. I think there's going to have to be a real sort of thing with producers up here about what they're choosing to plant from sort of now on and, and whether they're sticking with the, I guess, traditional varieties that have done well up here or whether they're looking at, uh, you know, newer varieties or just other varieties that have, I guess up until now haven't worked that well. Um, Syrah's having a really, uh, you know, big resurgence up here in the Adelaide Hills because, you know, we're now sort of getting that warmth throughout the day to, to sort of ripen and then holding that acid at night and, you know, mm. producing these lovely sort of peppery styles of, of, um, of Syrah that we couldn't have done 40 years ago because it's just too goddamn cold. So, yeah, um, yeah it's undeniable, undeniable. So we've got one very quick question. Um, what are your expectations on this year's vintage for the Adelaide Hills? So I want that answered in just one minute, please. So who would I'll like to kick it? off. Um, so a really tough bit of cultural year this year in, in the Adelaide Hills, but um, the people that did, did the work in the vineyard um, definitely reap the rewards. Whites are going to be um, absolutely outstanding from that sort of cool year, lovely, um, you know, freshness and vibrancy and acidity, all the things that we've, we've discussed here. Um, today. Uh, the reds are going to be lovely and floral and elegant and spiced and layered. Um, they may not pack the uh, sort of concentration that, that we've had in the past few years, um, but they'll be lovely sort of detailed, vibrant ones. Fantastic. Thank you very much indeed to the three of you. It's been a really, really interesting discussion. And I hope everyone else now will uh, go and buy some Adelaide Hills Chardonnay because you can see what diversity there is and such fantastic wines that can age well. So thank you very much indeed to everybody. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thanks for joining us.